You are welcome to this brief preview of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, reading from the New English Translation of 2019, with 5th century or earlier manuscript variants, intended for those who lead adult men's Bible studies. Please stop the video and review these suggestions for adult Bible study leaders. Ten, we are working from a nine-point outline of the book of Ephesians and have come to section 8, Spiritual Warfare. Note the structure of this passage based on five imperatives. First, be strengthened in the Lord. Secondly, clothe yourselves with God's armor. Noting the purpose of this, and the reason for it. C. Take up the full armor of God, with the result that you will be able to stand your ground. Fourthly, stand firm, following the designated actions. And E. Put on salvation and the Spirit, praying for all the saints, and praying for Christian workers, for a twofold result that they may have the right words to speak and may do so boldly. In a group setting, have someone read the text. Verse 10. After others have shared their observations or raised their queries, then you may share your own. For example, you may ask, How does one get strengthened with the Lord's power? Allow others to comment. Possible replies would include, Ask, and you will receive, according to the promise of Jesus. In other passages, strength derives from hearing the word of God, believing it, obeying it, or speaking it. You may wish to ask, cite some biblical examples of those who have received strength from God. Participants should be able to cite several. For examples, Samson, time permitting, have someone look up and read these proof texts. Then there was David, Jesus himself, the Apostle Paul, the author of this epistle, and a variety of Christians. Point B, clothe yourselves with God's armor. Have someone read aloud verse 11. Start a discussion on how does one do that? That is, how does one clothe himself with the full armor of God? Thank everyone for their replies. Note that the term scheme in this passage is the Greek term methodeia, from which derives the European word method. It refers to various methods, schemes, and craftiness. Ask everyone, what are some of the devil's schemes? They should be able to note several. Please see the next slide. A quick search of the New Testament for references to the devil suggests ten roles that he plays. First, he is the tempter. That is, he helps us to rationalize our disobedience and our debauchery or immorality. He's the denier. He removes truth right out of the minds of unbelievers. He has been a murderer from the beginning. He kills human beings whom he will rule in Sheol, Hades, or Hell. He is a liar. He whispers false ideas into human minds. He is a flatterer. He inspires arrogance in the incompetent. He's a trapper, bringing social disgrace to church leaders who succumb to his temptation. He is a ruler. He exercises power over the dead. He is a sinner. He is the original rebel against Yahweh, has been since the beginning. He is a hater. He sows discord amongst Christians, causing them to quarrel and despise each other. And he is the deceiver. It is he who moves national leaders to conspire, hence the many conspiracies. We struggle against spiritual forces. Have someone read verse 12. Then ask, In what ways must we struggle? Allow anyone to reply.
thank them for the response. Who are these spirit dudes, these spiritual beings? We shall deal with them in a moment. And how did they get into the heavens? We shall deal with that as well. And what harm can they do to us? Think in terms of temptation, destroyed reputations, broken families, disintegrating societies, criminal behavior, wars. The spiritual forces of evil include those mentioned in this chapter. First, the devil, the diabolos. He is the arch enemy of Yahweh, the one true God. The devil slanders Yahweh. He is the principal transcendent evil being. There are the spiritual rulers, authority figures who initiate activity or process. These are the first causes of the evil in the world. Some are called powers. They have ruling authority. In the distant past, Yahweh delegated authority to them over the nations, but they have abused their authority. There are world rulers, the cosmocrats. These are spirit beings who have parts of the cosmos under their control, extending even beyond the earth. And then all of them together are spiritual forces, evil spirits. Interestingly, this is the same term that is used for holy spiritual gifts. In this case, gifts abused to harm others. And they are all forces of evil, the poneria, the wickedness that ruins the life of people. These are pure evil minds. C. Take up the full armor. Discuss together. How does one do that? And what is the evil day? Think of the end times and the coming day of the Lord, the appearance of Antichrist. Will we really be able to stand during the end times? Remember the promise of Jesus. Stay alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to stand before the Son of Man. Yes, you can stand through the evil end times to welcome Jesus as he returns in clouds of glory. Psalm 82 is particularly pertinent to our passage, for it is a prediction of a future judgment to be brought against the spiritual forces in heavenly places. Have someone read verses 1 and 2, noting that this is talking about the one true God, a collection of spiritual beings called the divine council, and then lesser gods who give an account to him. See God's accusation against these lesser gods. Have someone read verses 6 and 7. Note again, these spirits are called gods, children of the Most High. Nowhere else in Scripture are human beings called gods, unless they're liars. Looking at this text in both English and Hebrew, we note that the term for the one true God, which is followed by a verb in the singular, the one true God stands in the divine assembly. The term divine here is another name for God, El, but it modifies the term assembly or council. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. Notice again, this is the identical Hebrew word, in this case, a true plural, referring to lesser spirit beings called gods. How did they come to be called gods? Well, Yahweh, the one true God, reminds them, I have said you are gods, and you are sons of the Most High, all of you. Thus our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but of strong spiritual beings in the heavenly realms. D. We are therefore to stand firm. Have someone read verses 14 and 15 aloud. You might ask, how does one do that? Discuss this together. The belt of truth. Well, how does one learn truth? And then the breastplate of righteousness. Again, 
have others discuss how does one become righteous. After thanking everyone for the replies, underscore that we become righteous by faith and faithfulness towards the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. And good news of peace. Uh, what good news is that? What is the content? Think of the promises, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a human being, his ministry, delivering others from the devil, his atoning death on a cross, his resurrection from death, his ascension into the heavens, his soon return, the gift of the Holy Spirit to be with us throughout the, our life, our coming resurrection, our reigning with him forever. That's all good news. And then peace. Peace with whom? Thank everyone for their replies. Have someone read aloud verse 16. Let others make their observations and pose their queries. Then point E, put on salvation and the Spirit. Reading verse 17. Note that the term here, the evil one, poniros, is related to the preceding term, evil. Poniros means being morally or socially worthless, or an evil intentioned person, used especially of the devil. How do we take up the shield? We believe the word of God. We trust in it. And how do we take up the sword? We speak the word of God, begging others to believe it. Point F, praying for all the saints. Read verse 18. And then verse 19 and 20. Praying at all times. Well, how do we do that? We're very busy. We have to lead a normal life. Well, let's think about three times when we might pray. There are, first, there are personal prayers. Allow participants to comment about their struggles with maintaining a personal prayer time. In personal prayers, we may say or ask anything we wish. We can vent our emotions to the Lord. He will understand. And we listen carefully. What is the Holy Spirit trying to tell us? What godly thoughts come to mind? We can also watch for results, that is, the way in which God answers our prayers. However, many of us will readily admit we are not disciplined enough to maintain a regular personal prayer time. Often we cannot think of things to say, or we get distracted, grow bored, or become doubtful whether God will do anything. Therefore, we should also, if possible, become members of small groups that pray together. Here you can share your urgent needs and burdens and get immediate prayer as each one may pray for each other's urgent needs. After God has answered, you can report back to the others. In small groups, you should make your requests without rehearsing details or history that God already knows. Then there is always a place for big group prayer, in congregational meetings, or in special conferences, or concerts in prayer. Here we present big requests. We make petitions to God on behalf of groups, communities, and even nations. We can intersperse our prayers with praise songs and scripture readings. However, in big groups, we do not expose our personal issues or those of others. Lastly, during your group Bible study, give everyone an opportunity to share or to tell others what is one truth, insight, belief, or action that he has learned from this text this week. And then ask everyone for next time to read a chapter a day from the book of Colossians in versions that they trust. And then especially, 
to study Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, preparing comments and queries to share with the others at your next Bible study session.